Greetings, everyone. Welcome to our worship service today. This is September 20th, and this is the First Congregational Church of Prescott, Arizona. I'm Pastor Jay, and so we welcome you to worship with us today. We're still worshiping virtually, although next week, uh, September 27th, is our 140th anniversary celebration, such as it is with COVID, but uh, we're going to have a meeting out in the parking lot with uh, some people, and then at uh, noon to two, we're having an open house here. So if you're in the community, you want to come by, we'll have everything open. Uh, we are asking for masks, and uh, you can tour the building and uh, look at everything. So that is next Sunday, the 27th. We invite you to join us. Uh, we continue to have our weekly meetings, our Zoom Bible study, Wednesday at 10, and our Sunday worship gathering, or gathering for fellowship more than worship, at 10 o'clock Sunday morning. Uh, if you're not on those email lists, if you want to call the office, we will put you on those, 928-445-4555. I haven't done this in a while. We usually say here at our church, no matter who you are or where you are on life's journey, you are welcome here. And we do have a welcoming statement that I would like to read to you that is always in our bulletin each week and on our website. And it goes like this. First Congregational Church of Prescott, United Church of Christ, is an open and affirming congregation. We include all persons without regard to age, race, gender, sexual orientation, ethnicity, gender identity, faith, marital status, or personal ability. We welcome all to share the celebrations and challenges of our congregation. No matter who you are or where you are on life's journey, you are welcome here. And so, welcome to our worship service today. We want to begin with the passing of the peace, and so let us share Christ's peace with one another and also with you. This is what we call Just Peace Sunday, and it is uh, timely because we do need justice and we do need peace. And so I have a welcoming statement to read that welcomes us all to this Just Peace Sunday service. This morning's worship calls us to continue on a course of justice and peace laid down in the foundational story of Exodus, the aspirational words of the prophets, the teachings and passion of Jesus, the courage of the apostles, and the faith ministry of the church. Just peace isn't a destination, but a path to the prophet's envisioned beloved community. The challenge is to faithfully examine ourselves, our community, and our culture for the thorns of racial inequity and economic injustice that chokes us off from the sprouting harvest of God's spirit. We need to sort the seed from the thistle. Our need for justice and peace is as urgent today as in the Pharaoh's brickyards of Exodus. So let us worship God. This is the call to worship. We keep Sabbath during this strange season of the coronavirus in uncomfortable new ways, in masks or by digital devices, without handshakes or hugs. But the church has survived wars and pandemics, financial crisis and civil unrest, relying on the promise that wherever two or more gather in the name of Christ, there the spirit of Christ will be found. It's times like these the spirit is most needed. The work's not done, God's reign not yet come. So let's gather in the name of Jesus Let's proclaim it from our pulpits, whisper it into our masks, sing it in front of our computers, and know that all over the world, the Spirit of God is molding us, shaping us, recreating us into the body of Christ. to 
This is the prayer of confession. We are all born into cultural currents that reward some and penalizes others merely for the color of their skin. Some of us benefit from generations of accumulated wealth. Others of us stagger under the burden of generations of racial oppression, discrimination, and bias. Where we've felt welcome, others felt shut out. Where we were invited to join, others were told they didn't belong. Where some have been willing to invest in us, others' gifts have been consistently undervalued. Where we've been asked to share our thoughts, others have been told to keep quiet. Where we've found opportunity, others have run into barricades. For over 200 years, this country has struggled to live up to the aspirational equality written into our founding documents. For over 2,000 years, the church has struggled to live into the promise of the gospel's beloved community. It is too easy to swim with the toxic cultural currents that ultimately drown both the oppressed and the privileged in the lie that the value of a person can be determined by the color of their skin. Forgive us for our complicity and collusion to this damaging lie. Redeem us by stirring up your spirit, which has turned tides of subjugation, injustice, and oppression in days past. Restore in us the determination to join in the holy work of reconciliation by pulling up the pernicious thorns of white supremacy and sowing seeds of economic justice. The assurance of pardon. Our worth is not determined by how the world judges us or how much the economy values us. Our worth is neither increased or diminished by our deeds our impairments, our productivity, or our failures. Our worth is determined by the price God paid for us. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us and for the world. For God so loves the world that he sent his only son to die for us. When we confess and repent of our sins, God forgives us. All right, it's time for the children to gather and the adults for the children's time. I came into the church today and discovered some changes that were made down front here. I, I think J.J. may have done this, I, so I've got to figure out where he's at. Uh, J.J., are you around? I'm back here. Oh, well, there you are. Hey, how you doing? I'm mighty fine. How are you? Oh, if you haven't joined us before, J.J. Uh, spent the summer down south, so he has a little bit of a twang. That happens now. He, he's my little brother. I introduced him about the time that COVID shut us down because we need some comic relief. And so JJ comes every week and tries to provide that to us. So thank you once again for joining us. You're quite welcome. All right. Well, I'm kind of surprised. What, uh, what do we have here? You've got all kinds of stuff that you put up here. Wow. Well, thank you. Yeah. Well, explain this to me. Now, I, I think I know what it is. Um, is this the ark? Yep. Oh, I see you've created the River Jordan as well here. Yep. Very good, very good. And, huh, you brought the 12 stones also. Wow. Well, yeah. Um, I've always wondered, is that, is that yeah with several syllables? Yeah, yeah. Okay. All right. Just wanted to make sure. All right. So, um, Wow, you've got the whole story of Joshua 3 and 4 right here. You are great. Uh, I knew it. All right, well, let me just describe this then to everybody. So here we have the Ark of the Covenant, right? Yep. All right, so that's where God's presence dwelt, and we're told in the story that the Ark went first before the people, and I see that you have given a respectable distance before yourself and the Ark, very sharp. Yeah, I don't want to get... And to touch it and, and get hurt, so I'm supposed to stay away from it. That's right. So that represents the presence of God. And here we have the Jordan River. 
And then we have the stones that we'll get to in a minute. So, uh, how are you going to do this? Well, I'm going to go over the Jordan. Oh, all right. All right, so let's see. Let's see if you act out the story. Here we go. Woo! Woo-hoo! Oh, look at that. Wow, you're going right through the water. Look at that. Wow. You're standing right on the dry ground in the middle of the water. Woohoo! All right, very good. Okay, and now we come down to these stones. So what is this all about? Well, they were told to get 12 stones out of the Jordan River to remember how God brought them across the river. That's right. So they were to set up this 12 stones as a memorial to always remember the story of how God let them cross the Jordan River. Look at all that water you just got through. Woo! Woo! Wow! Yeah. Well, thank you once again. You just amaze me every week. So how long did you work on this this week? Oh, I was here all week. Oh, wow. Uh, very nice. Thank you once again. Well, boys and girls, this is the story of Joshua and the people of Israel crossing the Jordan River. The Ark of the Covenant, which was the presence of God, helped them to go through the river, and they were to remember because of the 12 stones they were to set up. So, let's give thanks to God for what God has done. Let's pray. Thank you, God, for this reminder of your power, how you helped your people get through the troubled waters of the Jordan and come to the other side, and then set up this memorial to always remember it. So help us to give thanks to you for your power, and how you watch over us, and to always remember all the good things that you do for us. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. Thank you very much. We'll see, look forward to what in the world you've got going next week. Say goodbye. Bye. This is a scripture reading for today, chapter 3 of the book of Joshua, and I'm reading from the Common English Bible. Joshua took down the camp early in the morning. He and all the Israelites marched out of Shittim and came to the Jordan, where they stayed overnight before crossing. At the end of three days, the officers went through the middle of the camp. They commanded the people, as soon as you see the Lord your God's chest containing the covenant and the Levitical priests carrying it, you are to march out from your places and follow it but let there be some distance between you and it, about 3,000 feet. Don't come near it. You will know the way you should go, even though you've never traveled this way before. Joshua said to the people, make yourselves holy. Tomorrow the Lord will do wonderful things among you. Then Joshua said to the priests, lift up the covenant chest. Go along in front of the people. So they lifted up the covenant chest and went in front of the people. The Lord said to Joshua, Today I will begin to make you great in the opinion of all Israel. Then they will know that I will be with you in the same way that I was with Moses. You are to command the priests who carry the covenant chest. As soon as you come to the bank of the Jordan, stand still in the Jordan. Joshua said to the Israelites, Come close. Listen to the words of the Lord your God. Then Joshua said, This is how you will know that the living God is among you and will completely remove the Canaanites, Hittites, Hittites, Perizzites, Girgashites, Amorites, and Jebusites before you. Look, the covenant chest of the ruler of the entire earth is going to cross over in front of you in the Jordan. Now, pick 12 men from the tribes of Israel, one per tribe. The soles of the priest's feet, who are carrying the chest of the Lord, ruler of the whole, whole earth, will come to rest in the water of the Jordan. At that moment, the water of the Jordan will be cut off. The water flowing downstream will stand still in a single heap. The people marched out from their tents to cross over the Jordan. The priests carrying the covenant chest were in front of the people. When the priests were carrying the chest came to the Jordan, their feet touched the edge of the water. 
The Jordan had overflowed its banks completely the way it does during the entire harvest season. But at that moment, the water of the Jordan coming downstream stood still. It rose up as a single heap very far off, just below Adam, which is the city next to Zetharon. The water going down to the desert sea, that is, the Dead Sea, was cut off completely. The people crossed opposite Jericho. So the priests carrying the Lord's covenant chest stood firmly on dry land in the middle of the Jordan. Meanwhile, all Israel crossed over on dry land until the entire nation finished crossing over the Jordan. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Joshua 3 and 4 tell us the story of the Israelites finally moving to the promised land. In order to do so, they must cross over the Jordan. And Joshua 3, as Jane read to us, describes for us the events that happened as they crossed over. Joshua 4 is an interesting chapter because it tells us that they are to memorialize the event by gathering 12 stones. Let me just read a few verses from Joshua chapter 4. Joshua says to the people, Choose twelve men from among the people, one from each tribe, and tell them to take up twelve stones from the middle of the Jordan, from right where the priests stood, and to carry them over with you and put them down at the place where you stay tonight. And here's the crucial verse. In the future, when your children ask you, What do these stones mean? Tell them that the flow of the Jordan was cut off before the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord, when it crossed the Jordan, the waters of the Jordan were cut off. These stones are to be a memorial to the people of Israel forever. And so God makes sure that they're going to remember this event by gathering these stones and taking them with them. And so we have uh, not only the crossing of the Jordan, but we have it being memorialized in these stones. And more on that uh, as the sermon comes. May God bless to our understanding the reading of Holy Scripture. Amen.
Joshua 3 is about crossing over. Matter of fact, the Hebrew word avar is used 22 times throughout this chapter and chapter 4 to remind us of what it takes to cross over. And so there could be no more timely text than this text today and this story that tells us how the children of Israel crossed over into a new reality, into their promised land. We too need some help to cross over into the new reality we find ourselves in, and so we're going to hear today God's directions to them. As I thought about this text, I thought about uh, getting directions and remembering that pre-cell phone and pre-navigation, uh, we had to use a map. And often the maps weren't that great, and so we found ourselves having to stop at gas stations and ask for directions. It, sound, it would sound crazy to the young people today to hear that, but that was the reality. And if we went to a small town, uh, we would go to somebody and say, where is the Simmons house? And they would say, well, you go down to the Clarks and take a left, and then you'll see the Simmons house down from there. To which we would have to ask, well, where is that house? And then they would have to say, well, that's the red house uh, down there. So uh, we've come a long way in getting directions from the days in which we had to, to truly ask for help. And so today we're going to hear from God to give directions to the Israelites as they begin this process of crossing the Jordan. He gives them four directives. And I want to share them with you today, and I hope that they are instructive for our own journeys as we are crossing over into a new reality in our own lives. First thing he says is you are to follow the Lord, obviously. But notice in the text that uh, that's made very clear and simple for them because they are to follow the Ark of the Covenant. And the Ark of the Covenant was a four foot by two foot by two foot acacia wood box that had two cherubim on top of it, overlaid with gold, and it was very significant to the people of Israel. So when they saw the Ark of the Covenant, they thought that is the presence of God. And so the presence of God is going to go before them across this river Jordan. Inside the Ark, according to Hebrews chapter 9 and verse 4, are the Ten Commandments, the two tablets of stone, a jar of manna from their Exodus experience, and Aaron's rod that budded, or a portion of Aaron's staff that budded. That was a miracle back at that time. And so these three very important, prominent uh, things are in this ark, and they are symbolic to the people of God's presence and of God's power and of how God led them to where they needed to go. And so this ark goes before them, and they're to follow the Lord across the river. So I thought about that in our context, about our need to follow the Lord. What would that look like? You know, we're post-reality uh, now that we used to know. In this new reality in which we find ourselves, is there a need to change our directives as far as what it means to follow the Lord? Probably not. You know, just as before the pandemic, to love God and love neighbor was a way of following God, so it is now. To be a Matthew 25 Christian was the same before as it is now. Matthew 25 is where we read that Jesus says, as you've done it to the least of these, you've done it to me. And so we have that to look to, too, as a way to follow the Lord. We follow the Lord by the Spirit. We have the Spirit inside of us, the Bible tells us, and in a mysterious way, the Spirit guides us and enables us to follow the Lord. Sometimes it's a gut feeling that we have. Sometimes it's the aligning of circumstances. Sometimes it's doing a pro and con checklist until we feel we're being led in the proper direction. And sometimes it's the help of others who can help us to know how to follow in the path of the Lord. But in the end, it does come down to our internal ability to recognize the presence of God and to, to see in where God wants us to go. Not always easy, but in all these other ways, we are, I think, corrected and helped to follow the Lord. 
Notice also, in addition to the Ark of the Covenant leading them, it says, you are to stay way, way behind the Ark. It's a, quite a distance. They are to stay away from the Ark. Why? Obviously because it symbolizes the presence of God. And they're to take that very seriously. And they're not to get anywhere near the Ark. If you remember our going through the life of David, there was a man named Uzzah who was helping to carry the ark by the poles and the ark started to, to stumble and almost fall and he reached out and touched it and died. Uh, so in their understanding, the ark is so holy, so powerful that you're not to touch it, not even to get anywhere near it. And we've kind of lost that respect or that fear of the Lord as the beginning of wisdom, but uh, I think we can still look at it as a way to think about having some humility to know that our thinking is not always right, our way that we think we should go is not always right. And so to be humble and to understand that, I think, is the beginning of the fear of the Lord, is the beginning of wisdom. But it certainly was the case not too many decades ago that people feared God a lot more than they do now. I found in David McCullough's book about uh, Teddy Roosevelt, a little story about Teddy when he was little that's quite funny but instructive at the same time. Uh, his mother tells the story that when he was a young boy, he was afraid to go into church. And his mother asked him, what was, what's wrong? And he said, I think the zeal might get me. And she said, what do you mean? What's the zeal? And he said, well, it may be a dragon, it may be a crocodile, I don't, a, a monster, I don't know what it is, but I'm just afraid of the zeal. I've heard the preacher talk about it. And she was shocked, and so she got her concordance out and began going through all the verses that the zeal of the Lord is uh, present in. And she got to the Gospel of John, chapter 2 and verse 17. And when she did, this is what it says. This is from the King James Version, the old version we used to have. And... Uh, his disciples remembered that it was written, The zeal of thine house hath eaten me up. The zeal of thine house hath eaten me up. And so when the little boy heard that, he took it very literally, and he thought, the zeal is going to eat me up if I go into that church. And so it's a good, funny story about how people used to have more of a fear of God than they do now, but at least in the story of the ark, they were to fear the Lord enough to stay behind the ark because it was the presence of God and they were not to get close. Uh, again, translated to our time, perhaps just to have some humility, to realize that our way is not always right and we can at least pray, seek the counsel of others to make sure that we're following the Lord into our future. The second thing God says to them is to sanctify yourselves or consecrate yourselves or make yourselves holy. And if you research that in their day, that meant to take a bath, clean themselves up, and to uh, abstain from any relations. Uh, but it was a way for them to prepare for this journey ahead, which was going to be uh, an amazing journey. And so God wants them to sanctify themselves and get ready. It's no different than an athlete preparing for a race. There's a lot of preparation to do to get to, to the point where you could do that or somebody taking a test for that matter uh, to get yourself ready by doing the work that is required. And if you th think about it, as we move over into our new reality and try to cross over, uh, we do have to do some preparations. We can't make that journey without some strength, some internal strength. And so there's ways for us to prepare ourselves for that journey. Obviously, our spiritual life becomes very important at that point, and so to, to feed our spirit through word and prayer and sacrament, uh, fellowship of believers, whatever it is, uh, to get ourselves prepared for the journey ahead. Ephesians chapter 6, I think, puts it well when it talks about how we can have the armor of God upon ourselves. Let me get my glasses. Ephesians 6 says this, 
Finally, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on the whole armor of God. Stand firm, then, with the belt of truth buckled around your waist. It helps to follow forward and sanctify yourselves in the truth and integrity. With the breastplate of righteousness in place and with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. In addition to all this, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrow, arrows of evil. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, and pray in the Spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. With this in mind, be alert and always keep on praying for all the saints. And so as we are approaching these turbulent waters in our lives, we're able to gird ourselves up to prepare ourselves by sanctifying ourselves or consecrating ourselves, however we want to put it. But there is a process that we go through to get prepared for this journey and to get ourselves spiritually ready for it. I'm sure you've had to call upon those resources through these last months. But today you may feel like, you know, <laughs> I was okay for a month or two of this, but it's getting old at this point. I, my energy is draining. Uh, I, I want my reality back. Uh, it's not easy, and so I'm feeling weak. I don't feel like I can gird myself up with the strength that you're talking about. Well, the beautiful thing of the story of the crossing of the Jordan River is the next thing that happens in the text. So they're to follow the ark, they're to sanctify themselves, and then God says when you get in the middle of the water, you're going to notice that it is the priests that are there holding up the water away from you. It's a beautiful picture of how in this day in which we believe in the priesthood of all believers, that we're all priests to one another, we can share God's presence with each other, share God's word with each other, share God's compassion and fellowship with each other. It's a beautiful picture of how when you don't have that strength, there are others there holding up these turbulent waters you're going through to help you through. And so we all reach out to our family, our friends, our church members, our neighbors, whatever it is, we find ways to have others holding us up as we go through the turbulent waters of life. And so if you feel like your strength is waning, please reach out to others who can be that priest to you to hold back the turbulent waters from your life. And finally, as I read in Joshua chapter 4, God tells them in the end to go in there and get 12 stones and set them up as a memorial forever to what they just went through. It's a beautiful picture of how God allowed them to have a way to remember. And as they go through other things in their lives, they would go and look at those stones and remember, yes, God did deliver us, and God can deliver us again. The Jewish faith is very good at this. In the Seder meal, there's always a remembrance that's done, and the children are asked, children ask the questions so that they can begin to process and internalize how God has helped God's people through the centuries. In the church, maybe the closest equivalent we have is the sacrament, the Lord's Supper, in which each time we partake of it, we remember. We remember the sacrifice of Christ on our behalf. We remember the life of Jesus and all that he did and stood for. And it feeds us to be able to move forward in his way. And so... We have these memorial stones, and I'm sure in your own life you have many memories, many objects that bring back memories for you, whether it's pieces of furniture or jewelry or whatever it is. Uh, they are powerful in our lives because they, they speak to us and they enable us to move forward with what's going on now. Our church is about to have its 140th anniversary celebration starting in 1880. And this sanctuary that's been here since 1905 is a memorial stone in a sense. Uh, people pass by it all the time on the main street here in town. 
And I'm sure, uh, not probably every day, but every once in a while they look at it and it speaks to them of history. It speaks to them of God's presence. It speaks to them of how God has been with this church, this community, this nation, this world for a long time. And it speaks to us of the fact that if God could help all the people who worshipped here before to get through all that they got through, then God can help us to do so as well. So follow the Lord, consecrate yourselves, uh, allow others as priests to help you through, and remember what God has done in the past. Joshua 3 and 4 have a lot to say to our current reality. May God bless it to our understanding. Amen. come to our prayer time together. I think collectively, virtually, we have many, many requests to share with God, and so in this prayer time we shall do so collectively and individually. 
we also have much to pray about in our nation and world, uh, whether it's fires in the west or hurricanes in the southeast, whether it's on this Just Peace Sunday, the need for justice and for peace, a lot to pray for. So let us join together in prayer. Holy God, we come before you today and we do lift up collectively all the requests that are on our hearts today. You know each situation, you know each person, you know what they need. And so in the mystery of prayer, we pray for all requests today as we lift them up to you. May your will be done, may you give insight and direction, healing, comfort, encouragement, whatever it is. May it come from you now to all who are listening to this prayer. And we do pray for our nation, uh, a nation in need of justice and peace. Uh, we pray that you would bind our wounds and bring us together as we uh, go forth into this fall and into the new year. May there be a way for uh, peace and justice to grow and prevail. We pray for our brothers and sisters in the West and the Southeast and globally going through all kinds of trials and tribulations and turbulent waters. May they know your presence, may they know your abilities as they gird themselves up with your strength. May they know the help of others as their priests who can be ministering to them through trying times. And may we all remember the times you have already brought us through. And may that be courage, strength, and comfort going forward. We pray all of this in Jesus' name, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. We come now to our morning offering, collection of our offering. We appreciate all of you who are giving, whether by mailing a check to the church office uh, whether by electronic bill pay from your bank or from uh, hitting the tab on our website, which is uh, prescottfcc.org. Uh, Prescott and F is in Frank, C is in Charlie, C is in Charlie, uh, uh, .org. And so uh, there's a donation button there as well that you can give through. But uh, once again, we appreciate all that everybody's doing. We are doing our best to cut our expenses to help ourselves through this very troubling time when we can't all be together uh, and we are surviving. So thank you to all of you who are making this happen. Let us receive our morning offering. you please join me in the prayer of dedication. Gracious God and source of all good gifts, thank you for the resources in our lives, in our community, and in our nation. Thank you for all that we share today to make our lives, our community, and our nation more welcoming. Bless us in our continued ministries that we seek your peace and justice. Amen. Thank 
And now hear this benediction. May the words spoken and heard by us here now be translated into action as we become the agents of God's just peace. Let's actively engage in the creation of God's intended community of racial equity and economic justice, knowing that this is what makes God smile. May Christ's example inspire you. May God's spirit empower you. May God's blessings surround you, rest gently upon you, and protect you from the winds of the world's thorns of racism and thistles of injustice. Amen.